Dr. Vincent Lam is from the expatriate Chinese community of Vietnam and was born in Canada, right here in London, Ontario. So thanks for coming back to the place of your birth. Um, Dr. Lam did his medical training in Toronto, where he has been practicing as an emergency physician. He's just recently switched, and we'll tell you all about that in a few minutes. He's also a lecturer at the University of Toronto. Dr. Lam has also worked in international air evacuation and expedition medicine on Arctic and Antarctic ships. Dr. Lam's first book, I have it right here, Show and Tell, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, which you can buy downstairs, won the 2006 Scotiabank Giller Prize and was adapted for television and broadcast on HBO Canada. And I'm telling you, it reads like a thriller. I just reread it. Dr. Lam co-authored The Flu Pandemic and You, a nonfiction guide to in influenza pandemics, which seems quite timely today. And it was recognized in 2007 with a special recognition award by the American Medical Writers Association. Dr. Lam's biography of Tommy Douglas was published by Penguin Canada as part of Extraordinary Canadian Series. And the Headmaster's Wager, Dr. Lam's first novel about a Chinese compulsive gambler and headmaster of an English school in Saigon during the Vietnam War was a finalist for the 2012 Governor General's Prize. It was long listed for the 2013 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and long listed for the 2013 Impact Dublin Prize as well as shortlisted for the 2013 Commonwealth Book Prize. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Vincent Lam to London's first Literary Festival Words. Now I've forgotten how to turn the mic on. <laughs> well, I had the good fortune um, to hear Dr. Lamb speak this afternoon um, to about 200 medical professionals at the University Hospital about narrative in medicine, why it's important to tell stories in medicine. Um, it was a fascinating discussion, and um, while I don't want to revisit that, I want to talk about the fact that you're what is amazing to many people in the room, and myself included, is that you're able to practice medicine full-time and be an award-winning writer. They, they seem like two very different things, but I imagine they, the, your paths cross as a writer and a doctor. Well, I think the paths certainly, great. The paths certainly cross in the sense that they, they cross within the concept of people thinking that there are these two separate paths, but I don't really experience them that way. Um, you know, I just experience them as, as what goes on in my life. And, you know, I happen to be drawn to two different things. I think a lot of people are drawn to, uh, to lots of different things, and, you know, it's not, it's not really that unusual. I just happen to be drawn to medicine, which happens to, to occupy this sort of um, archetypal cultural status, and I'm drawn to writing, which has this, this set of notions around it as well. I mean, the truth is that most writers do something else as well, and that's simply the way writers engage with the world. Uh, it just so happens that I do medicine. Well, um, but I, when I read Blood Reading and Miraculous Cures of the Anne Louise of Lane, when I say that it read like a thriller, I found myself at 2 o'clock in the morning still reading when I had to get up early. Hear me. I might have to take your mic. Okay. So, I, just to repeat, I, I felt that bloodletting and miraculous cures read like a thriller because two o'clock in the morning I found myself turning off my light but then turning it back on. I had to find out what happened. And um, there's an example where you talk about uh, a patient who's um, giving birth and she uh, is in distress and you have to, or the doctor, Dr. Ming, has to prevent her from giving birth um, so he, she actually gets on the gurney with her patient. And what I thought was remarkable about it was you're able to write from both the patient's perspective and the doctor's perspective. And that has to have a lot to do with 
your empathy, I think, is as a doctor? Well, I think that both in the practice of medicine and the practice of literature, I mean, what is really, really crucial to the exercise is that um, one seeks in many ways to transport oneself out of one's own perspective and into that of another. And I mean, I think that's really obvious to us when we engage literature, either as writers or as readers. We know that as writers, we're trying to enter into the experience of another and to represent it. And as readers, that's very much what we, we seek out. We seek out the experience of knowing a world which is not our own. Um, and, and I think when medicine is practiced in its most humanistic form, that's also what goes on. That the doctor has a set of skills, a certain set of technical proficiencies, but really what the doctor is doing at a very, very core level is the doctor is trying to transcend their own vision of the world in order to enter an understanding which represents something of what the patient has and then they seek to bring their set of skills and their set of knowledge to that. Now, I'm not saying that medicine is always practiced that way. You know, I'm not so naive as to say that, but, but, but I do think that when medicine is really working at its best and most humanistic form, that's what it's doing. So, you know, if there, if there is sort of a, a commonality between what I do as a writer and what I do as a doctor, it is this notion of sort of floating out of myself um, and engaging in something that's outside of myself. And, and that's a very, very appealing no notion to me. Um, and I think it speaks to, to the thing that you described. Well, um, one of the things that you talked about today um, was being a good listener as a doctor. Because patients have stories to tell and they want to know that they're being heard and that their story is important to why they're there, especially in the eMERGE room, because I would imagine they don't always come in calm and collected when they're in the emergency room. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's, that's very true. And I think one of the things I was talking about today was the notion that as a healthcare professional, you know, we're often trying to transmit information. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that if we seek to be heard um, as healthcare professionals, we often first have to be able to listen and to latch onto the story of the other. And I think it's funny, I mean, we, we live in a culture that's sort of overloaded and oversaturated with information. You know, and, and it's just completely, um, you know, brimming with people um, telling their thing, tweeting, Facebook posting, mm -hmm. you know, I'm guilty as well, you know, I have Facebook and Twitter. Um, but I think that the, um, the consequence of that is there can be a certain sense of um, numbness to mm -hmm. all that content. You know, I think all of us have had the experience of being on some sort of social media platforms like, oh, okay, my friends have posted all these things. I'll just like about 20 of them because <laughs> I know it'll give my friends a sense of, uh, of quick validation and it will at least temporarily enhance their self-esteem. You know, and, and that frankly is the motivation. And so that's a very sort of glib, very superficial sort of engagement. We all engage in it. I do it as well. Um, but but I think what we lose in that, because we become sort of inured to actual content and actual communication by the overabundance of content, mm -hmm. is that sometimes we don't really stop to actually listen or to read properly or to really digest what it is that we're reading. And I think that's one of the things that I always hope that books can do because mm -hmm. books as a cultural medium, I hope, lend themselves to a form of reflection uh, which is a little bit slower and I hope a little bit more durable than much of what exists right now mm -hmm. in sort of our vast, stormy sea of words and content and all the rest of it. So life has to be more than 140 characters. You have to be able to curl up with a good book, whether it's the digital ebook or, or the hard copy. Sure, I mean, I'm not particularly exercised about format, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, the digital ebook is, uh, you know, is the same words that are, that are in the hardback, but, but I, I certainly think, you know, I, I don't rule out the possibility that life can be adequately described in 140 characters, but I don't think I've seen it yet. As long as it links to maybe one of your books. <laughs>
Right, they have those tiny URL things, you know, maybe they can compress the contents. Yes. Um, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, um, inspired by your work as an ER doctor? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures is about medical students and it's about doctors. And it's really a book about the process of transformation which occurs in a person who decides to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a work of fiction, but it is absolutely and deeply informed by my own experience of becoming a physician. And there's a, a chapter in there, if you haven't read it, about SARS that is really quite gripping. When, um, because you were actively working in the ER during uh, the SARS crisis in 2003. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and that was a very that was a very interesting and also very challenging episode. Yeah, an episode. Your actual physical work in the ER. During yes, SARS? yes, I was working in the ER during SARS, and uh, you know what's really what's really striking to me now um, is that it's amazing how quickly something which um, you know two months previous to its occurrence would seem unthinkable mm -hmm. becomes an absolutely accepted and normal part of the daily routine. You know, uh, two months prior to the occurrence of SARS, you know, there was no sort of, um, there was no sort of universal precaution, um, which was of the level that took place during SARS. There was no specific screening for that set of risk factors uh, upon entry into the hospital setting and so on and so forth. You know, so, so it was really interesting to me how, you know, you really can very, very rapidly shift what your experience of normal is mm -hmm. um, when the occasion arises. So you were seeing hundreds of SARS patients and uh, in the ER, people coming Oh, no, in? no, absolutely not. I mean, you know, I'm not even sure there, there were hundreds of SARS patients in Canada. Oh, okay. I can't you know. even remember how many actually I know, came in. Was yeah, this is part of the, well, this but, is part of the, the funny thing about public risk and public risk communication. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, certainly there were thousands and thousands of, you know, um, suspected, concerning, you know, and so on, mm -hmm. people who were screened and who may have had one or another risk factor for SARS. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, in fact, there were not hundreds and hundreds of SARS cases in this country. You know, and so the, this is one of the, the really difficult questions which always arises around public communication and public risk communication when there are potential new threats, you know, and it's very difficult to, to really get the risk communication piece right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the really great things in, in SARS is that I think SARS gave our public health agencies some practice at doing that. Uh, SARS actually did not kill a lot of people. It had a huge impact on the system. The number of people who died was quite small. Um, but, it, but it was really very useful and instructive in terms of the functioning of certain elements of the public health system. And so SARS actually probably did us a, a really big favor in a lot of ways. You know, it, it gave us better preparation for things like influenza pandemics, mm -hmm. which are probably a much more uh, real and durable concern than SARS. And as a corollary, it gave us a much better um, preparedness mm -hmm. for things like Ebola, which I know is, is, mm -hmm. is very sort of au courant in the media. Mm -hmm. And you wrote a book about it, the flu pandemic and you, a handbook. Yes, I wrote a book about, uh, about influenza pandemics, you know, precisely for this reason. So shortly after SARS, there, there was quite a bit of concern at one point about influenza pandemics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a friend of mine and myself were, were, were just sort of uh, struck by the lack of really high quality, responsible, mm -hmm public communication around it. And so we thought we should write a book. So we wrote a book. OK, so you can pick that up. It might even be for sale downstairs tonight. Um, it's not a work of literature. No, you know. but <laughs> nevertheless interesting. Fair enough. Um, but a great work of literature that, that we haven't talked about yet is The Headmaster's Wager and your character, Percival, Percival Chan, who is, has something to do with your own family. Sure. So Percival Chen is inspired by my grandfather. It's not my grandfather, but he's inspired by my grandfather. And Percival Chen uh, is a guy who lives in Vietnam during the conflict in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he is the headmaster of an English school. He is very successful financially. And he is an indirect beneficiary 
of the American involvement in Vietnam, because it is the American involvement in Vietnam which lends currency and value to the English language. And of course, he teaches people the English language, which becomes a very profitable thing to know in Vietnam during the conflict in that place. Um, so he has that side of him. And as it turns out, he also um, has quite an addictive personality. And he is uh, very, very uh, incorrigible gambler and womanizer, um, you know, which, which causes complications in his life. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. But this is loosely based on your grandfather's life in Vietnam, right? <laughs> well, you know, in, in, in the broadest possible sense, I would say that, you know, the things that I've said up till now, um, headmaster, successful womanizer, gambler, you know, and it causes complications, those are true both of my principal character and of my grandfather. Mm -hmm. But the actual things which happen in the book turn out to be fiction. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that they are fiction, is that more freeing than if you were actually writing a book about your grandfather's very interesting life, growing or working there during the, uh, an interesting time during the Vietnam War? Oh, sure. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I, in the case of bloodletting, I felt very constrained. I felt I had to write fiction because I wouldn't want to write about my own patient's mm -hmm. stories. There, there's a small issue of doctor-patient confidentiality, yes. which you know, is rather important. Um, but actually, with the Headmaster's Wager, I felt completely free. I felt I had liberty to, to plunder my family's tales and sort of <laughs> take advantage of them, um, you know, in, uh, in the most disgraceful ways possible. You know, I felt I was totally, totally at liberty to do that because many writers have done that and, you know, there's no sort of professional code of conduct um, which bars that. Um, but I actually found that it didn't work. You know, I, I tried to write a number of episodes and to write a plot which was centered around things that actually happened mm -hmm. to my grandfather and I felt very constrained you know I couldn't mm -hmm. I couldn't get past that block of oh it didn't actually happen that way mm -hmm. you know or sometimes I just couldn't imagine it sufficiently to render it so I gave it up and uh, and I wrote a book of fiction and a very interesting book of fiction fascinating the headmaster's wager and you you actually started it much earlier and then left it for a while. It's true. Well, The Headmaster's Wager was a book that I wanted to write when I first wanted to be a writer. So, mm -hmm. so I started thinking about it when I was about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I took very, very uh, horrifyingly bad stabs at it mm -hmm. and wrote some terrible, terrible things. You know, so don't be embarrassed if you're, if you're starting and you're writing terrible things. Um, and then a few things happened along the way you know, I went to medical school and... Mm -hmm. you know, and you won the Gillings, we were... should mention. You, you right, know, right. That was in there somewhere. Right. Well, right, it's funny because when I finished my medical training, I knew I wanted to write, and I mm -hmm. began to write The Headmaster's Wager, and I really didn't feel that I had the skill set. Mm -hmm. So after about six months, I stopped working on The Headmaster's Wager, and I started, you know, writing a medical short story just as an exercise because mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know, there's an adage, you write what you know, and so I thought, I know something about medicine, I'll write a medical short story. And, um, and very soon I got the idea of writing a book of linked short stories, mm -hmm. really, really as an exercise. Really? You know, I didn't expect it to be published. Um, so, so I spent some time, a couple of years, uh, working on bloodletting and miraculous cures, really thinking, you know, it would go in the shelf. And most writers do do this, you know, you write things, they go on the shelf, you don't publish them, and you go and you write three or four more, and then finally uh -huh. you publish something. Um, so that's what I expected to happen, but it sort of turned out differently. But when, when you actually write a book like Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, you put it on the shelf thinking, oh, it's nothing special. It gets nominated for the Giller Prize? I mean, what was that like when you got that phone call? Were you, did you, did you say, is this, a, you have the wrong number, or? Well, actually, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Yeah. No, did and, you believe it? You know, and, and, and I have to confess, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get published and get nominated for a prize without you doing a few things. Yes, I'm sure. Following putting on the shelf. I mean, you end up taking it to a publisher and mm -hmm. you don't think they're going to publish it, but they publish it and then, you know, and then you get nominated for a prize. Um, but it was very funny because I, I found out by voicemail, right? And so they called and they, they said, oh, you know, this is just a message for so-and-so. Um, just to let you know that you've been long-listed for the Giller. 
but they actually didn't say my name. Oh. <laughs> they said, this is a message for, you know, some other writer. Fill in the blank. Oh, my. You know, so wow. it seemed that it was a voicemail for someone else. So what did this you do? This actually happened. So I thought, oh, well, that's really great for that person. <laughs> I should, you should maybe call them. call them so they can call the right person. Because the, the, they did not leave my name on the voicemail. They left someone else's oh, name. Interesting. I think it was the next person on the list. Oh, really? Yeah. OK, so what did you do next? Did you call them and say? You no, I was them? busy. I had things to do. So I thought <laughs> you were in the ER. they'll sort it out. You know. <laughs> They're smart people. And but then I got a call from my agent, and my agent, you know, said there was good news and explained it to me. And life changed after that. That's true in, in many ways, but, um, but, but also many things don't change. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's really, it's, it's really great from a career point of view to win big prizes. You know, I don't think, um, I don't think that it would be accurate to deny that, you know, lots of good things happen, there's attention for the books, and then as a writer that's very satisfying because more people know the book, um, and, uh, and one is able to publish more broadly, and that's really, that's really very nice, but um, the things that don't change, you still have to go and write, mm -hmm. you know, which turns out to be equally difficult. Is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you sit hands I was sort of hoping it the... would be much easier, actually, you get a special kind of brain module after you win a prize and it would just get incredibly easy but it, it probably there's, no there's such more thing. pressure you know I, I spent about a year telling myself that there was not mm -hmm. and sort of say no 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 I don't feel any pressure you know I, I was very happy being unknown actually mm -hmm. you know I was quite content you know sort of doing my thing and doing my medicine um, so it's not that there was anything negative about ceasing to be unknown but it, it was a surprise to me and I, it wasn't something I had prepared for or, or really given any thought. So, so it, was, it was jarring. Um, and yes, after about a year of telling myself I wasn't experiencing any pressure, you know, I finally caved and admitted, yeah, I am actually feeling a bit of self-consciousness. So. so fingers are poised over the keys when you're not uh, um, at work as a physician. You're writing another book. Any hints? Yes. Uh, writers do not like to talk about what's next. No. Okay. <laughs> Next question, Janice. Um, all your years in the ER, it seems to me being in the ER is about problems and solutions and it must be very rewarding because at the end of your shift, you've solved a lot of problems in one day. And not every physician has that luxury. How is that related to writing and the, the craft of writing? Well, I mean, there there is a thread of relationship between medicine and writing, and the thread is really in narrative, that I think in both instances one is really, really ultimately working with a story. Mm -hmm. um, but there are great differences as well. And as a, as a physician, as you say, you know, problems come and, and meet you. Mm -hmm. You know, you really don't have to go and, and find them or invent them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it turns out that's very pleasant, that's very nice. You know, I think, I think we as, as physicians sometimes think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm overloaded with all these problems and, and one can certainly feel that way. But imagine if you had to go and invent all those problems yourself and then mm -hmm. fix them, which is what the writer has to do. Mm -hmm. This is true. Um, so, you know, the stimulus is much more external. People bring you the start of a story mm -hmm. and you as a physician work with sorting out the story and interpreting it, reinterpreting it, hopefully recasting the story mm -hmm. into a better story mm -hmm. in, in the best possible instances. Um, you know, so, so you are, are very much a character in a world that is unfolding around you as a physician. And that's quite different from writing. Um, it, is also, it is also very immediate, you're right. You know, as, as an emergency physician, you know, you get that that hit of gratification and accomplishment, mm -hmm. you know, with every bone that you put in the right place and every heart attack you treat and, mm -hmm. and every prescription you write and all that, that kind of stuff. Hopefully they're the right prescriptions from time to time. Yes. You know, it's not always the case, but once in a while. Um, but interesting and, uh, you describe yourself as a character, as a doctor, because I think that's probably why when I read Bloodletting, and I'm sure other people feel this way in the room, that you had the empathy for both the patient and the doctor. 
because you see yourself as a part of, of the puzzle. Well, maybe that's true, you know. Um, you know, I've never thought about it quite in those terms, but I think you're probably, you're probably right. You know, I don't, I don't see myself um, as, uh, as being an omniscient narrator mm -hmm. when I'm wearing my doctor hat at mm -hmm. all, you know. And, you know, certainly as, as, as a writer, you know, I mean, in, in a sense, one, apart from the issue of, of voice, you know, where you choose whether you're an omniscient narrator or a first or a third person or whatever, but, you know, as a writer, you know, in a sense, one would think logically, okay, you know, I am the all-seeing power that oversees this page, um, but it rarely feels that way as well. You know, like, it, I, I think it really only works for me as a writer when I feel that I've gotten to know my patients well enough. Look at that. That was a slip, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. Yeah. A slip. He said patients instead yeah. of characters. I know. <laughs> when I know my patients, when I know my characters <laughs> okay. well enough, sort of a cognitive loop running there, um, my characters well enough that, that I feel that I'm interacting with them, you mm -hmm. know, and I feel like I'm sort of, my ideas are sort of bouncing off the ideas of my characters. And I realize that neurologically that's not a reality. You know, mm -hmm. I realize that those characters you know, are a bunch of little pathways that I've created. And I get that, I get mm -hmm. that. You know, but my experience is still very much um, one of a character interacting with my characters. So, so at a certain point, does a character have enough integrity that you know what they're going to do next? You trust your, you've written your characters such that you know what their actions should be that ring true? Yes, yes, I feel that way. And I, I feel that it doesn't come easily. You know, I, I feel that I spend a lot of time struggling with my characters mm -hmm. and struggling to know them in that way. But I always feel um, that by the time I get to the end of the writing process, that, that there are no other options for my characters apart from the options that they are choosing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, neurological reality aside, you know, yes. I feel like their, um, their sense of presence requires them to make certain choices, and that's what they do. So you never write for the audience? You never write for the reader? Well, you know, there's, there's two ways of, of thinking about that question. You know, when, when people talk about writing for the reader, you know, there's, um, there's a sense in which people are, are asking, are you, are you writing to please the reader, mm -hmm. right? Um, and to that question, I would say no, but I would also say, I don't really think that's what my best readers want. Mm -hmm. I think that what my best readers want is they want to be confronted with something that exists unto itself, which may be difficult and which may be challenging and which may not be comfortable, but I don't think that the best reader ever wants to be written to mm -hmm. with some sort of prediction of what will give them pleasure or satisfaction. They want to be surprised by an emotion. And that can really only come from a faithfulness to the work. Mm -hmm. um, but there is another way of asking and thinking about that question, which is, you know, are you thinking about your reader's ability to engage in this work? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, yes, I do think I'm writing to the reader, um, but mostly with respect to language choice and with respect to to leaving things out which are distracting. You know, I really, really aim for language which does not obstruct the communication between the reader and the story. And, you know, my style is, is I think, one that tries to minimize any potential barriers that way. You know, so in that sense, I'm thinking of my reader, um, but, but that is with a view towards the communication and not with a view towards you know, trying to predict what the reader wants and giving them that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think ultimately the smartest readers want what I can predict. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to be surprised by their own responses to something. And are you surprised by your own writing sometime? Do you feel that the craft of writing makes you a better writer the more you write? Um, I, I am surprised sometimes by, by what happens in my writing, actually quite regularly. I mean, it's one of the only things that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, very often that I'll sit down and, and start drafting. And, and something will happen on the page which I didn't predict when, when I sat down. And that is one of the great things, these small discoveries that occur. Um, and then in the, in the larger sense, in terms of the, the structure of a book, 
Uh, I was also very surprised, actually, at the structure of this book as it, as it sort of landed and solidified. And, uh, and it sort of shocked me, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it felt like the right way to go. And so, so that's, what, that's what it was. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think that's part, of, that's part of why I write. I think that's part of why a lot of writers mm -hmm. write, in order to see what's in there. Well, you also wrote a book about Tommy Douglas, which we haven't even mentioned yet. And you were inspired by Tommy Douglas and his relationship to socialized medicine. Is that, I, I'm, I should ask you that question, not just state it, but is that why um, you decided to, to write about Tommy Douglas? Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, I mean, you know, to, to, to me, Tommy Douglas is, is one of these really, really fascinating figures in the Canadian political landscape. You mm -hmm. know, he wasn't really uh, set up to be such a successful politician in the sense that he didn't come from a powerful or wealthy or prominent family. He was a Scottish immigrant um, and came from very modest beginnings. And he really was instrumental in the creation of universally insured health care mm -hmm. in Canada, which to me is, is, is really a very important expression of how we feel about ourselves and about each other and about our relationship to each other as citizens of this country. You know, so, so Tommy was interesting. You know, he was also a very funny guy. Like you can still get lots of his speeches on YouTube. And they're very entertaining. Um, you know, he, he worked as a stage performer at one time. He was a minister. And by all accounts, he was a very funny minister. And, uh, and so, so he managed to do all of this you know, not without hard moments, but with mm -hmm. a lot of humor and grace and charm. And so certainly all of that stands out to me as someone whom we should think about more when we think about the potential of politics mm -hmm. in this country. And so, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to Tommy for all sorts of reasons. And, uh, and, you know, how could I not write a book about him? Well, you're leaving London uh, after coming to our literary festival, and you'll go back, not to the ER, but to, you have a new job uh, as a, a doctor. Do you want to just briefly mention that? Sure, yeah. Um, over the course of about a year, I made a transition from emergency medicine to addictions medicine. And just at the end of June, you know, I sort of cut the cord, as it were, and, uh, and, uh, and hung up my, my ER saddle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so now I do addictions medicine. I also um, do some research work, which mostly has to do with um, with abuse prone compounds you know so so a lot of that uh, is is just circumstance in that it was time for me to make a life change in my clinical life. I had been doing emergency medicine for thirteen years, mm -hmm. and some of it has to do you know just with the pleasure of of discovering something new and uh, also you know, being able to, to give up certain frustrations which had sort of grown in my mm -hmm. mind as an emergency doctor. Um, but, uh, but I'm also very interested in addictions as a mm -hmm. phenomenon. And so that's one of the other big reasons why I decided to do that. Well, you've been so forthcoming about your life as a doctor and a, as a writer. We thank you for all the great insights and to be part of this inaugural festival. Thank you very much, Dr. Vincent Lund. <laughs>
and you may have seen it on television as it was a multi-Gemini uh, award-winning TV miniseries. It was shortlisted for both the Giller and the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. And that book was followed by the second in the trilogy in 2002, The Last Crossing, which I hope you'll be able to buy downstairs. It's a really engaging book. And that won CBC's Canada Reads, three Saskatchewan Book Awards, and the Canadian Booksellers Ex Libris Prize for Fiction Book of the Year. And in 2011, Guy van der Haag brought more characters to life in the third in his literary western in, in his trilogy with another award-winning novel that is both a love story and a thriller in A Good Man. In addition to Guy's novels and three collections of short stories, he has also published two plays. And in 1993, he received the Canadian Authors Association Award for Drama for his play, I Had a Job I Liked Once. Now that's a title. We can all relate to that. Guy is also an officer of the Order of Canada, a member of the Saskatchewan Order of Merit, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Please welcome Guy van der Haag. Well, thanks for coming, Guy. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, what, at the cocktail reception, I said to Guy, are there any questions you don't want me to talk about? And he said, don't mention the 15 years I spent in jail because my probation officer doesn't know where I am. <laughs> I, I never reported. Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't sure because you didn't smile whether you were serious <laughs> or not, so. I, I wasn't. Okay, good. Well, I called your three literary westerns a trilogy. Is that in fact right? Um, it's what I would call a very loose trilogy. Um, they're set in Montana, southern Saskatchewan, and Alberta in a time period, um, the 1870s, which I've always seen as kind of crucial to the history of Western Canada, but also crucial in a larger sense to Canadian uh, history. So even though uh, characters don't recur, uh, what, I, what I was attempting to do was, was to write a history in fiction, if that makes any sense, about my part of the world. Okay. It's set in the Cypress Hills. Um, largely. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's some, it's, some of the novels are quite peripatetic, like The Last Crossing starts out in Montana, goes goes through southern Saskatchewan into southern Alberta. Um, the Englishman's Boy uh, begins in Fort Benton, Montana, and then actually makes a 50-year jump in time to Hollywood, California. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what, what I was attempting to do in these three novels was to draw a picture of uh, what I like to think of as my local history mm -hmm. uh, in a particular uh, period of crisis. But you, you st tell us first about the crisis. Well, I mean, there were a number of crises. Um, in the early 1870s, there was a very strong possibility that, that what is now Saskatchewan, even Manitoba to a certain extent, and Alberta could become American territory. Mm -hmm. Um, there was also the crisis between indigenous people and the beginning of the westward migration of, of, of uh, people of European background and the collision that occurred, you know, at that moment in history. The third novel, A Good Man, uh, um, be begins at, with the arrival of what was then known as the Northwest Mounted Police, which, you know, the RCMP in Western Canada and what that meant in terms of settlement pattern, but it also touches on, on a question that I think is, you know, given the, the recent news, uh, the question of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And in the 1870s, which, which what concerned the Canadian government at that moment in time was actually what they would have called Irish terrorism. Uh, Fenianism, the ass assassination of Darcy McGee in Ottawa, um, 
the invasion of Canada by the Irish Republican Army uh, into uh, southern Ontario, across the border from Detroit, etc. So, and that had implications right from Montreal to Toronto uh, west to where you. Well, exactly. Were. I mean, Montana in the 1870s was actually, and much of western United States was a hotbed of Fenianism. Uh, the man who was appointed the governor of Montana was a Fenian. Hmm. Um, and in fact, he was involved in, I mean, all of these plots were, were a little bit kooky. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they didn't have probably much chance of ever succeeding, uh, but attempts to invade what is now known as Winnipeg from Minneapolis, uh, trying to connect with uh, the, the Métis, there to, to create an American-style republic, uh, even planned incursions into what is now British, British Columbia. So all this history informed your trilogy. I mean, this is still fiction that we're talking about. Right. But you have to stay true to, the, to, to history to what, make it real? I mean, what I attempt to do, because much to my shame, at one time I thought I would be an academic historian, but discovered I didn't have the chops Oh, okay. or the analytical skills to, to be a good historian, um, I would say that I steer pretty close to, and, and this is, a, this is a, a, a dangerous word, the facts, okay. because the facts are always hard to ascertain. But what I do is I inject fictional characters mm -hmm. into, in, into that. So, for instance, I have a description of the Battle of Ridgeway, which occurred in southern Ontario with the Fenian invasion, but the characters that, that inhabit my novel, there's no record of mm -hmm. them you know, being with, the, with the, you know, the, the Queen's Own Militia Regiment at the Battle of Ridgeway. Um, so it's, it's a case of not wanting to do what I would say serious damage to the historical record, mm -hmm. um, but injecting fictional elements that, that make history, I hope, to the reader seem more intimate. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I think about, about, about what the historical novel should and can attempt to do in the best cases like, like Pat Barker or Hilary Mantel is that th th they help the reader to feel as if the past was an intimate experience lived by people in some ways very much like you and I are, mm -hmm. uh, but working their way through problems that may have occurred 500 years ago, 100 years ago, whatever. Well, your writing is so imagistic for lack of a better word, the, the, the images and the descriptions are so detailed that you, you take the reader right there. And I just wanted to um, read one paragraph from The Last Crossing. Actually, will you hold my notes? Certainly. Don't look at my next no. questions. Because I left out the one about the jail. Can I start crossing those? Yes, cr yeah, cross okay. out the ones that you don't like for sure. So, so this is... Um, Page eight, so I'm not giving much away of The Last Crossing. When Simon, uh, one of your characters who's left England to, um, uh, he, I wrote my notes there. What did I say here? If I um, can be of any assistance, well, just ask. Why don't you tell us about <laughs> Simon? You tell, tell us, um, what, what's he doing? He's left England to, to come and, and, and change the narrative a little in Canada. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things is, again, Simon is kind of, loosely based on a great-grandfather of mine who was not a missionary to Western Canada, but belonged to a strange Protestant sect that actually believed that the Indians were the lost tribe of Israel. Okay. Uh, so um, Simon has, has come uh, to North America to take, as he would put it, the word of Christ uh, to the lost Jewish brethren in, in North America. Okay, so here's the paragraph. He's caught in a snowstorm, and, he's, and here's what happens. Simon scrambled to his knees, knife upraised. 
drove the 16-inch blade into the horse's chest, sawed the belly down to the legs, guts spilling, a thin stream sifting out of the lips of the incision, plunged his hands into the mess of entrails, tore away, scooping off L behind him, hacking with the knife at whatever resisted, whatever clung, moaning, hunching his shoulders, drawing his knees up to his chest, wriggling away at the mouth of the wound he burrowed into the balmy pocket. So he's crawling into the belly of a horse. Because he's, he, he thinks he's going to freeze to death uh, in an extremely cold uh, Saskatchewan blizzard. How did you ever come up with that idea? I, maybe I'm perverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll take my notes, thanks. When you speak you know, about, about writing being imag imagistic, and, mm -hmm. and I, I think Vincent touched on that, but you know, in, in the sense of inhabiting both you know, the minds of, of, as he said, patients or mm -hmm. characters, mm -hmm. Uh, part of it is to imagine yourself in the mind of someone in a dire situation in which it's a life and death circumstance. Um, what, what has happened just prior to this is that Simon is lost in a blizzard. Uh, his horse has broken a leg, so he knows that the horse is not going to survive anyway. Uh, so he makes a decision to save himself uh, by using the only shelter that he can imagine at that moment, which is to shelter himself in the warm interior of a horse. Of a horse. Incredible. And that's how the, it's right there in the first chapter. Um, the Englishman's Boy. You can read these out of order, by the way, which is yes. what I did uh, yeah. in this trilogy. So um, The Englishman's Boy was the first um, of the trilogy, and did you find, as you were doing your research, that the book changed? Well, you know, very much so. Uh, w one of the things that I find in researching the historical novel is that it's a bit like the tip of an iceberg. Mm -hmm. uh, for all the research I do, maybe 10% of it makes, it makes it into a novel. And then while I'm writing a novel, I suddenly discover that there are things that I need to know, mm -hmm. uh, which then stops the narrative often in when it's, I would like to think of as when it's in mid flow to find something out. I mean, at the end of the English, I mean, this is just a small instance of this. At the end of The Englishman's Boy, I wanted a scene uh, at the end of the novel that echoed a scene in Nathaniel West's The Day of the Locusts. Um, and I want it to occur in China, outside Chinese, um, uh, Grauman's Chinese Theatre. But unfortunately for me, Grauman's Chinese Theatre didn't exist in 1923, oh. but Grauman's Egyptian Theatre did. Okay. But, and this was basically before the days of the internet. So I was doing this fruitless search for descriptions of Grauman's Egyptian Theatre I finally discovered a postcard that allowed me to, to gave me enough information that I could write a description of the theater. Uh, it probably took me two weeks to do that. Nowadays, you know, given you know, with internet, uh, maybe a half hour, you know, <laughs> to find the same information. So, so talk a bit about that because the the book is set in Hollywood and in the Wild West. Why did you contrast the two? Well, I, again, like, I, I, I think so much of, of, of writing is happy accidents. And I, I had had an idea that I wanted to write a book about the Cypress Hills Massacre, which occurred in southern Saskatchewan in 1873, and was largely responsible for the formation of the Northwest Mounted Police, mm -hmm. and led to the Canadian government sending this force out to whatever word you want to apply, Occupy the West. Um, when I was beginning to, to, to think about this book, it seemed to me that that was a fairly thin bit of material. 
Then I was reading a sociological journal and I suddenly discovered that many of the, the so-called outlaws, desperados of the Wild West actually end, ended up in Hollywood in the very earliest days. Uh, there was a man called L. Jennings um, who was, <clears throat> was a famous bank robber, right? And, and he, he made, he went to Hollywood and he made two movies about, silent movies about his exploits as a bank robber. The man who arrested him as a bank ro uh, uh, robber didn't like the story that Al Jennings did, so he ended up in Hollywood and he made a movie telling his side of the story. Uh, people like Bat Masterson actually made appearances in very early silent films. So um, it struck me that somebody who had been present at the Cypress Hills Massacre in 1873 could actually be a movie extra in Hollywood in 1923. Um, and one of the things that sort of interested me in attempting to write the book was first of all the idea of a physical frontier, mm -hmm. uh, which occurred in 1873, and what I would call an artistic frontier in 1923, mm -hmm. because when people started making movies, they had no idea how to make movies. Mm -hmm. It was an entire, entirely new art form. Um, the first time that somebody was shown on camera with their legs cut off, uh, the audience was disturbed. I mean, early films were shot like plays. You know, one stationary camera at a distance that, that mm -hmm. did everything. But, you know, th 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 there were inventive filmmakers like D.W. Griffith and his, his uh, uh, his cameraman, Billy Bitzer, who introduced things like a close-up. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that was part of my interest, was that it, it was a sense of, of, of worlds changing. Uh, in 1873, that was a crucial period, the West changed forever. Uh, Western society changed with the advent of the motion picture industry very, very much the way I'm sure that, that we are forever changed by, you know, innovations in computers and all sorts of other things like that. Well, it's a good thing the close-up was invented by the time they <laughs> made a mini-series of The Englishman's Boy, because <laughs> it won many Gemini Awards. And how did you feel about the adaptation? Well, actually, I had to feel fairly good about the adaptation because I wrote, wrote the it. Screenplay. <laughs> and John Smith directed it. Yes. It's a terrific director. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I mean, I was so happy when, when John Smith um, became the director of that miniseries because probably in Canada he's most fam famous for The Boys of St. Saint Vincent, mm -hmm. which was a basic, not a documentary, but a fictionalized doc documentary about about uh, child abuse mm -hmm. in religious institutions. Um, and, you know, he went to the Supreme Court uh, on his own tick uh, to, to, to make sure that the, uh, that film was seen on Canadian television. So, yeah. Do, do you prefer writing for television and film uh, over novels? I wouldn't say I prefer it. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I like about that sort of um, writing is that it's two things. I mean, it tends to be uh, cooperative mm -hmm. um, in that, that you are not solely responsible uh, for what shows up on the screen because, you know, cameramen, directors, actors all have a, have a hand in the final project or a product, so it's not on your shoulders. But it, it's also like really technical and specific, which is kind of interesting for someone who writes fiction and, and has no constraints on them. Um, I remember when Bob Hoskins, who was going to play the American movie producer, uh, came over from England uh, and he said, I, I can do it in an American accent. 
Uh -huh. He said, but I can't do an American accent for speeches this long, <laughs> right? So this was two days. Uh, so, I, you know, I had to sit down and I had to, you know, re rewrite basically his scenes. Really interesting. Now, just before we go, I know uh, one other part of your career is, and your life uh, is teaching. And you've taught for many years at various universities. But you don't teach your students to be writers. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that I attempt to do is I teach my students to be readers. Um, because no one can be a writer without being an acute and attentive reader. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, quite frankly, most people who take a writing class at a university um, don't aspire to be, to be, whatever word applies, professional writers. Mm -hmm. um, I think what they're looking for is insight into the process of writing and insight into what constitutes a piece of literature. Uh, but as a teacher of creative writing, I, I, I come at that whole topic from a different direction. Teachers of literature teach a finished product, mm -hmm. right? That, that it, it, it's a text. Um, I try to teach my students how texts are made. Um, so it's far less analytical, mm -hmm. I would suppose, than in a literature class. Now, on the other hand, I've been fortunate, like, you know, over many years of doing this, I've had, you know, a fair number of published writers, some of whom have been really successful. But I don't pretend that that has anything to do with me. I think that they would have become, you know, writers, uh, whether they had studied with me or not. Maybe I hastened the, the process a little bit. Um, but um, I, I, I sometimes tell my students that, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, that becoming a writer is 50% talent and 50% whatever word you want to apply to a character. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started writing, there were maybe, I had three friends, I think, and we were all, when we were at university, we were hiding the dirty little secret that we wanted to be writers. Uh, the other two were more talented than I, than I was. Uh, but in hockey parlance, I'm a grinder, hmm. you know? Uh, so I, I ground more than they did. Well, thank goodness you did. And thank you so much for being part of London's inaugural Words Literary Festival. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Guy Vanderhaeg. <laughs>